Hello, everyone. Welcome to Own Your Image Beyond the Mirror. I am Deshante. You guys know um, this is our second show, and this time we are talking about leveling up your faith and activating a self-care routine that helps you propel in life. Today, I have with me Pastor Scott Lapierre. Am I saying that right, Pastor? Lapierre. Yeah, that was pretty good. Yeah. All right. Perfect. I wanted to make sure. Um, he is the pastor of Woodland Christian Church, a best-selling author, author, and a conference speaker. He is truly amazing. Kane and I um, have been following him on YouTube and listening to a lot of his sermons and his teachings, and they have blessed us. So we're super excited to have him on the show. Um, I'll welcome you, Pastor Scott, and allow you to really introduce yourself and tell your story a little. Okay. So, my wife, Katie, and I grew up together in Northern California, and we weren't Christians at that time. Uh, we became Christians later in life, and then uh, I went into ministry. I was an elementary school teacher, and after I became a Christian, I started pastoring and authoring some books and doing some speaking, and my wife and I have eight kids. We're in uh, Southwest Washington, um, been here since 2010, and pr probably figure we'll spend the rest of our lives here. We love our church, and of the community and just thankful to have this opportunity to share uh, with your listeners about the Lord and any ways that I might be able to bless them. Amazing, amazing. Eight children, that is a blessing. How are you guys? Are you guys homeschooling? Are you guys, how's it going right now? Are you, is Washington on lockdown? It, what's happening? Yeah, good question. So this is definitely a, a pretty different season, isn't it? So we'd always been homeschooling, so it wasn't a dramatic change for us as it was for some people. Um, yeah, the, there's been a spike in some of the cases. And so they are, it does seem that Governor Inslee is locking things down again. And it had kind of opened up during summer. So we'll see what these next few weeks or months hold. It'll be interesting when people watch this uh, in January, then yeah. it'll, they'll already know the answer to it. <laughs> right, it'll be, a, it'll be a, new, a new season, obviously. So, okay, so we'll just hop right in. Um, what does the word faith mean to you? Okay, very good. So uh, we have a good definition in scripture that faith is, is uh, the things we can't see that we have confidence in, you know, as Hebrews 11 says it. And so it's believing those things that we can't see physically. And people put their faith in different things. I mean, it's, it's interesting if you think about it, we exercise faith every day. If you were to sit in a chair, you're exercising faith. Faith that that chair is going to, uh, hold you. If you were to get in a plane, you have faith that that plane isn't going to crash or you, you know, you drive down the road, uh, you're in a car and you're heading toward other vehicles doing 60, 70 miles per hour. And you have faith that you're not going to slam into them or they're not going to slam into you. And so we all exercise faith um, throughout our lives. It's just really a question of what we put our faith in, whether that's a good decision or not. If someone wanted to jump off a building and they said that they had faith that, um, you know, they would fly, then obviously they're exercising their faith the wrong way so not a smart way to exercise faith I love that you said that yeah I think about that all the time we exercise faith every day we don't think about it it's just literally getting in the car going to the grocery store that takes a ton of faith especially out here I live in Los Angeles so the traffic is heavy I'm like all these cars you never know what can happen but we have faith that will leave to go to the grocery store and make it home so mm -hmm. that's a beautiful thing um how has your faith strengthened you in, in your life and in your ministry? Mm -hmm. Well, without faith, I would have to trust that really in myself or in my own effort and strength, I'd have to, um, all my confidence would be exclusively in me. And I'd have to believe that anything I was doing was uh, simply a matter of my effort. But, but uh, my faith in God gives me confidence that what I'm doing is fulfilling his plan for my life. Um, I can go into any endeavor or, or plan uh, with confidence that if it's God's will, then it's going to happen. And so in that sense, faith is really what gives me the strength to do all the things that uh, I need to do in my life, because without, without faith, I'd have to be trusting exclusively in myself. But, you know, faith gives you that, that confidence that you're, that God is going to support you. God is going to, if he's called you to do something, and he's going to equip you to do it and see it through to the end. Love that. And I know you said you and your wife, when you first met, you guys weren't Christian. 
how did the transition from um, not being Christian to now you are a Christian and you're a pastor and you have a full church and you're ministering to many, many people, um, how did your faith play a role in that? Or how did your faith transition um, from not being a Christian into where you are now? Sure. So I was a school teacher after college. I was an officer in the army and then I started teaching elementary school and I really loved it. It was uh, very satisfying and fulfilling to me. And then I became a Christian and my heart for ministry grew. And um, I kind of, I guess I would say my passion for teaching elementary school kind of started plummeting. I'd stand in front of my students and, you know, tell them to open their math books or reading books. And I really felt like I wanted to tell people to open their Bibles and I wanted to be sharing God's word with people. And so it was a huge step. I'm not a big risk taker. I mean, it's interesting talking about faith here because I'm uh, pretty conservative in terms of the chances that I take in my life. And so I had, um, you know, I didn't know I was going to become a Christian and I didn't know that I was going to become a pastor. And so I really, the trajectory of my life was really toward excelling as a school teacher. And so I got my credential in California, which is, a, um, you know, it's easier to to get credentialed in some states. California is one of the more difficult states. And then I went forward and I got my master's in education, which just shows how confident I was that I was going to keep doing this for the rest of my life. I mean, if I would have known at that time that I was going to, you know, stop teaching elementary school in the near future, I wouldn't have put forth all that time and effort and money toward, um, you know, credentialing and, and getting my master's. And so anyway, my whole point is once I felt called to ministry, to step away from education, which was a very secure position. Once you get tenured as a teacher in California, you can pretty much count on having a job the rest of your life. You know, the Department of Education isn't going to run out of money. So it's nice and secure. Teachers in California can be paid pretty well. And so to step away from that, you know, took a considerable amount of faith because I actually, when I started working for a church full time, I think it was about half of what I was making as a teacher. So just to give you some perspective there. Um, the church wasn't huge. They kind of stepped out in faith, bringing me on full time. And so it took faith on their part too. And I had to trust that if this was God's will for my life, then he would provide for me and my family. And, and my wife and I know you kind of hear about someone having eight kids and you think that maybe they wanted to have a lot of kids. You know, we are thankful for the kids we have. And um, my wife's in her late thirties. So we, we probably have a couple more kids, but really, our vision for family was simply, and this is another instance of faith, was simply to leave our family in God's hands and let him give us the children that he wanted us to have. I kind of wanted to get to the end of my life and feel like God had built our family for us. And if he gave us, you know, um, two kids or 10 kids, I just wanted it to be the number of kids that he wanted us to have. But the fact is, we knew that he could be giving us a lot of kids and my wife was going to be staying home and homeschooling. And so, it, you know, it took a lot of faith to uh, step out. And I mean, looking back, it's kind of nice talking about this because I can take for granted or forget how well God had provided, but he really took care of us. You know, we never went without. We've always been comfortable financially. God's always found ways to provide. I think there's, um, you know, good examples in scripture of God stretching what people have. You know, that widow with the oil, there's just a, a few pots, you know, and they just keep multiplying and got and She's never, she never lives extravagantly, but she never goes without. And I kind of feel like that's God's plan for many people's lives that, um, you know, you're not going to be totally wealthy, but you're not going to be struggling. And that's, that's been the case for us. And so, yeah, definitely took faith on uh, my wife's part and mine to, to, you know, enter the calling that God had for us in ministry. And even coming up here to Washington, the church was kind of, it had went through a difficult time where the previous pastor had left, a lot of families left. And one of the gentlemen in the church told me, he said, we can only pay you for eight months. Mm -hmm. If we don't, if the church doesn't grow, if the giving doesn't increase, we only have eight months worth of pay for you. And so I was a, I was a youth pastor in California and I came up to Washington to be a senior pastor. And I really felt like God wanted us to come to this church. But again, that was stepping out in faith too and just trust. And then the church grew. Uh, we've brought on another full-time. There's two, uh, I have an, a full-time associate pastor. We have a secretary. And so God is really, you know, blessed wonderfully. And, but yeah, it, it definitely took faith early on stepping out. Wow. You know what? I, I want to point something out that you said, you said on your own, 
you are not a risk taker. You're not a, a big leaper, you know, but with God, you have been able to step out on faith in all areas of your life. And I really feel like that's like the true definition of really activating your faith. Yeah, I agree. That's that. Um, it's interesting you said that. I, I like the title. I like the the tagline that you you guys are using for this, um, activating your faith, because, um, you know, like Habakkuk 2, 4, it says the just shall live by faith. And so we talk about living by faith or walking by faith and what that looks like. And I think regularly what comes to mind is like missionaries, you know, going to third world countries or, or people that are, you know, risking their lives, passing out Bibles in, you know, communist countries where they could be arrested or persecuted, but really activating your faith or walking in faith is anytime you, um, you know, do something without certainty about what's going to happen simply because you trust God and believe that this is his will and that he's going to provide for you and care for you. And that whatever end um, you, whatever, however things end was God's plan or God's will. And so you can be confident in that. Love that. Really, really love that. You have a very powerful testimony. Um, audience, really take some notes here. This is really activating your faith. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit. Um, let's talk about self-care. We are, this show is all about activating your faith and self-care. And we kind of, we want to really dive into what self-care means to you. And really from like a male perspective, how, how do you dive into self-care? Okay. So I stay um, pretty busy. Obviously, I think people can, you know, there's kind of a ditch on both sides. One, one side is we work too much. Uh, the other side is laziness. You know, you kind of have workaholism on, on, uh, on one side, and then on the other side, you have laziness. And so, uh, you know, between pastoring and authoring and speaking and a large family, I can definitely err on the side of, of workaholism. And so self-care for me, interestingly is deciding not to work at times it's it's recognizing the importance of rest um you know god he rested on the seventh day we know in the book of genesis he wasn't it's not like he was tired it's not like he needed a break or something he was sending down a pattern for us to follow and as we read through scripture we see the importance of rest we see that it's you know it's a reminder to us that we're frail that we are uh, weak that we're humans that we have limitations um, and so for many people, self-care, especially like in the United States, many countries have, you know, limited work weeks. They almost have like mandatory rests and breaks. But here we could work 60, 70, 80 hours a week, you know, without stop. And so self-care for us means saying, OK, I'm going to take this day off. For many of us, it's Sunday. I'm, I, there are things that are nagging at me, you know, pulling at my time and energy. But I've decided I'm going to spend this time with my family. I'm not going to look at that email. I'm not going to respond to that phone call. And so for many people, self-care involves just saying no and following kind of that pattern established in God's word of, of working so many days and then having at least one, one full day off to rest. Yeah, that's so good. I love that you said like, A, it's like always a tug because I'm always a tug being an entrepreneur, like tugging towards doing all the work and checking the emails all the time. But making the decision like on the Sabbath on Sunday to rest and not check the emails, not, not uh, look at the phone, not, not do all these things and really dedicating yourself to rest and spending time with your family. Um, it is a battle sometimes. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with, do you ever feel guilty because you feel like you need to be working more? Or there's so many things you need to do or on the other side of it, when you're working, do you ever feel guilty when it's like, Oh, I need to be spending more time with the family or, yeah, so um, I would say I definitely have to try to be deliberate when I go home, even if it's not, you know, my rest day. When I go home in the evening, I do need to be very intentional and in, in not looking at my phone, uh, investing time with my wife and with my kids. We have, you know, social media. We have computers. It's very easy to be home with your family and not really be with them whatsoever and not give them the intention that they need on investing them. So when we talk about self-care, I mean, self-care is, it's caring also for our, our marriage. It's caring for our family. It's making sure that, sure that those are priorities. And so in Matthew 6, Jesus said to seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. And so That's the, my favorite verses on my wall. Oh, okay. Wonderful. 
And so what I kind of take that to mean is that if we put God first in our lives then everything else will go well and everything else will work out. And we're just kind of supposed to go through life doing the things that God wants us to do. And then he'll pick up the tab or he'll make sure that things are, things are handled well for us. But if we don't have God first, it doesn't really matter how hard we work. <clears throat> doesn't really matter what decisions we make. We're you know, probably going to experience an amount of uh, frustration. God doesn't, God typically doesn't, and it's gracious of him to not allow us to succeed apart from him. Uh, we're not investing in the eternal then. And so um, one way is just to remember, you know, this is what God wants me to do. I want to put him first. And at this time in my life, this is, these are the, you know, priorities he wants me to invest in. And, and I think that's one of the other things is it's kind of opportunity cost. We all need to live recognizing that to say yes to one thing is to say no to something else. Mm-hmm. So all your, I'm guessing that many of the people that are listening are entrepreneurial. They, they want to begin their own businesses or ministries. You know, for me, I was pastoring and then I wanted to start authoring also. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of another risk or chance for me too, because I had no experience writing or publishing books. I had all this material from sermons that I thought could translate well into books. But as far as how to go about that, I mean, just because you have a lot of notes from sermons doesn't mean you can just, you know, whip it together and, and have a book. And so it, I, you know, recognizing that was pretty entrepreneurial for me to start this ministry um, of authoring. And for the people that are listening, we, cause we can't say yes to everything. You know, people that do that, there's a few possibilities. If you try to say yes to everything, you're either going to burn out or you're going to do many things mediocrely. And so I think it's better to do a few things excellently than to do many things mediocrely. And whenever we're saying yes to too much, things start falling through the cracks. We stop, we start failing. We're letting people down. We're failing to meet deadlines. And so the, the whole point really is we need to be able to prioritize and to know that God wants us to do this and this, but he doesn't want us to do this. And often what's kind of difficult for people is that what we say no to isn't a bad thing. It's not immoral. It's not sinful. I heard it said one time that the enemy of best is good. The Mm -hmm. enemy of best is good. And I like that. The idea is you're not always saying no to bad things. You're saying no to good things because those simply aren't the best things that you're supposed to be doing. And so we need to be asking, what are the best things to be doing? What are those things that God wants me to do? And then sometimes that means saying no, like that. I I feel like my email, it's almost like sometimes I'm checking it, reading messages, responding as fast as messages are coming in. And if I tried to meet every single, and most of the requests are good, you know, people read my books or they watch my videos. And today I think I had two or three emails where people were asking me marriage counseling questions and things like that. I'd love to be able to minister to every person that has some marriage question, but they, I, I, should, I need to encourage these people to get plugged into a local church, have their own pastor and elder, because I can't, I simply can't do that. So yeah, prioritizing is just really important, knowing when to say yes and when to say no. Yeah, that's really, really good. And I love that you pointed out that there could be good things that you have to say no to. I actually, I was on the Bible app, I was reading, uh, I can't remember what the plan was, but I read a plan and that was like a key point that I took away. Like, there, this is good, but you still may have to say no to it. It might be not be what you need to be doing right now. And so, and that's okay. You know, it's, it's, it was hard for me to be okay with that. I'm learning that still, but I think that just for the audience, you guys, it's okay. There's going to be opportunities that are good opportunities, but you may have to say no to right now in your life. They may not be for right now. So that, that's a really good point um, that you brought up. So I love that you talk about the journey into being an author and how you had to figure that out. Can you tell us a little bit about that and and how you went from pastoring and having the notes and now you're like, okay, I'm going to do the book. Sure. Yeah. I'm, I love talking about this. I've done an amount of, um, of kind of self-publishing help with people when they've called me. So pastors, you know, kind of write their sermons out differently. Some pastors just have kind of abbreviated notes. They put a few keywords. And then on the other side of the spectrum, which is where I am, I write my notes out very thoroughly. It's more like a manuscript. I'm regularly polishing it and refining it so that by the time I preach those notes, I'm very familiar with them. Uh, It's written out. I want to be extemporaneous when I read them. 
but I have a, a pretty polished uh, collection of notes. And so there's Amazon has a self-publishing arm called KDP or Kindle Direct Publishing. And so for any of the people that are listening who are entrepreneurs, one of the best ways to um, kind of have an open door or establish some credibility is through a book. It, you, it just is an immediate way, I mean, to be able to hand someone a book, to be able to have your name attached to a book. You can, many people even publish books and then, I'm not joking, offer them for free on Amazon simply because it's going to introduce their name to so many people. And so sometimes you almost have to go into authoring not expecting to make a lot of money, but using it as a tool or resource to open other doors for you. There's some, we have some friends that have started a business and I said, and it, it deals with cancer. They're trying to help people who have cancer. And I said, you guys ought to write a book about some of your experiences and what you've learned about cancer. Offer the book for free on Amazon, and then it'll introduce enough people to your business that I think it'll be a good investment for you. That's so to make, it, to make it simple, it's called KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing. That is, there's a lot of different ways to publish books. So this is the one that I would highly recommend. I think it's the standard. Um, it's pretty easy to get. You turn your manuscript into, uh, or you, you just have a manuscript and a cover. You really only need two files to upload. There's a few, there's a little more to it. I mean, you need to make sure everything's the right specifications. I would, I would encourage people to get a cover designer. Don't try to do the cover yourself. I mean, everyone says not to judge a book by its cover, but everyone judges a book by its cover and nothing really screams amateur ish more than a, an amateur cover. Um, it's really difficult to publish traditionally, which means like with a, with a, a large publisher, because they're very selective and they generally only choose people that have a very large name or a very large platform. So if someone's, so just to give you an idea of how naive I was, when I first started down this publishing journey, I'm going and I'm looking at, you know, Thomas Nelson publishers and looking at all these publishers websites and they all say the same thing. They say, we do not accept unsolicited manuscripts, which means you can't just like send them your manuscript. They, they work, they don't even, most publishing houses don't even work with authors. They actually work with a literary agent. So what happens is you don't even, if you wanted a large publisher, you don't actually try to get a large publisher. You try to get a literary agent and then the literary agent pitches your book to different publishers. And then the literary agent keeps a percent of the royalties or the sales that you make. Um, I, I, I just want to note that I didn't, I didn't know that about, you know, I know a lot of people, like you said, are trying to do books. So go, go ahead. That was good. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about this as much as, as much as you like. So you'll send, you'll quarry a literary agent. Well, I'll make it real simple. Let's say there's three levels of publishers, large, medium, and small, large publishers are the only ones that offer any sort of marketing, um, budget or help. Uh, a small and a medium sized publisher are going to expect you to market your book and that what they're going to do is they're going to give you the cover, the editor, the interior of the book. But since you're responsible with most of the marketing, I would highly discourage anyone from using a small or medium sized publisher. I would just encourage self publishing because if you use a small or medium sized publisher, you're going to get about like 80 cents or a dollar per book. If you publish through Amazon self publish, and then you're responsible for the cover the editing in the interior, it's a little more work for you, but then you're going to make, you know, three to $4 per book. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to, it's going to be a lot more incentive behind all the marketing. After you've built up a platform, a newsletter with subscribers, you know, got a website, a blog, you, you're adding um, YouTube subscribers or Instagram, whatever the case, then a, a, a literary agent might be interested in you and will pitch your book proposal to publishers. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happened. I actually, I was really frustrated at first because I could hardly get anyone to respond to me. And I just decided, you know what, I'll just self publish. So I started self publishing and experienced an amount of success. And then last year, um, a friend, of my, another author that I met, he said, I'd like to introduce you to a literary agent. I think she'd be interested in you. And I signed with her and then she hit, she picked me up, signed me and pitched uh, my book to, some publishers and I got picked up with Harvest House for a four book deal. And so I've been self publishing and now I'm going to going to go the traditional route. But if anyone's tuning into this, unless you have a pretty big platform, you know, a lot of subscribers, a lot of speaking engagements, don't even try to go the traditional route. Just go the self publishing route. There's lots of cover designers and editors. There's people that can do the interior for your book out there that you can contract to do these things. And then you'll have your own book that you can get on Amazon, you know, pretty, 
pretty quickly, pretty easily. Wow, that's amazing. And I and I love that at the beginning you said you you didn't you weren't thinking about becoming an author, but again, that faith took you there. It took you from California as a teacher to you know being a husband, a father, a pastor of a church, and now being signed to a what a literary agent for a four book deal. That's amazing. So congrats. Thank you. Really, really, really good. Good. Um, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up for last words. What would you say? Um, let's see. Any last words on faith, self-care? Well, just you, you were just kind of talking and I hadn't really, it's interesting. Um, you know, I'm sharing this stuff, but I hadn't really thought of it the way you, you had, as you just mentioned, you kind of mentioned that my faith brought me through these different chapters and, and listening to you say it, I thought, wow, that's interesting. That's a neat way to kind of see you know, what God has done in my life. And as I look back, I, I don't really look at it as though I decided to do this and decided to do, the, to do that. It's more like I'm kind of walking along one foot in front of the other and then trying to be, you know, open-handedly serving God, just whatever you want for me, Lord, whatever you want for my life, use me for your glory and honor. Um, and then it's like, he kind of opens these doors. And that would be my encouragement is don't try to you know, like James says, don't say what you're going to do today, tomorrow. It's, it's a foolish thing to do. Instead, you know, the, the word is a lamp to our feet. A lamp only gives you a few feet in front of you. It doesn't, it's not, you know, it's not showing you miles ahead. And so just kind of trying to go through life where you're open and receptive to what God wants and letting him open those doors. Um, and, you know, that's just one way to walk by faith where you're, you're letting God lay out that path in front of you. And I think one and I think, I think one thing just regarding the self-care is if you're doing what God wants you to do, then you'll never have to worry that you're doing too much or mm -hmm. too little. So if you're just doing the things that God has put on your plate, that he's plopped in your lap, then you can be confident that it's not too much and you can be confident that it's not too little. But otherwise, if you take your life, you know, kind of out of God's hands, you have to wonder is this what God wants me to do? Or is it just what I want to do? Is it going to be too much? Is it going to give me a heart attack, you know, before I'm, when I'm in my forties or, uh, you know, am I going to have high blood pressure? Because, and if you're an entrepreneur, if you're entrepreneurial, as your listeners are, that's a, everything's on your shoulders. It's very easy to get overwhelmed and burn out. So you really want to know that you're walking God's path for your life. Thank you, Pastor Scott. That was very, very well put. Guys, take notes on this. That was that was good. That spoke to me for sure. Um, so I know that you have a gift for the audience. I'll let you tell them a little bit about that. Okay, yeah, so it's a free gift. Um, I My first book was on marriage. I really developed a heart for marriages to see strong marriages. I think, basically, I think, you know, marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. Strong marriages, result in strong families, strong families make strong churches, strong churches make strong communities, but it all kind of begins with husbands and wives having strong relationships. And so my first book, um, Marriage God's Way, well, I guess just to get to the gift, the gift is called Seven Biblical Insights for Healthy, Joyful Marriages. So Seven Biblical Insights for Healthy, Joyful Marriages, and it's uh, kind of a, a short read. It's just seven very practical, biblical pieces of advice from different marriage conferences I've done and marriage counseling sessions that I perform that I hope can be a blessing to all of you. And um, yeah, you can get it for free and it would just be an encouragement to me that you're learning what God's word says about marriage and that your relationship with your spouse is being strengthened. Beautiful. So thank you. Side note, guys, this is how um, we actually found Pastor Scott. I was looking out some of the marriage uh, sermons and the teachings that he has on YouTube. So really, really good stuff. Download that if you are married. Um, and we are so thankful to have you with us today. And you guys will tune, tune in for the next show and have a good day. Bye. Yeah.